As Pastor Jeff said, uh, I am not feeling well this morning at all. Um, I got some form of what they think is a bite on my foot, and uh, like a spider bite or a tick bite or something like that. And uh, so it's all like infected and red and kind of nasty. And they started me on some antibiotics, and I feel like I'm kind of like here I am, but here I am, you know what I mean? Just kind of in the clouds. And uh, I just kind of have to laugh because I, I wonder if that's how my dad lives his life. Just kind of, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so if I say anything that's a little uh, just questionable, I don't know, just blame it on the medicine <laughs> or whatever. But today is a special day, not only because you all get to hear me preach, but uh, also because all of my mom's siblings are in town, and so I brought my cheering section in the second row here. And uh, it's, just, it's, it's really special uh, because now I get to introduce my kids to the people that so generously send them gifts at Christmas time. I think that they thought that maybe Amazon Prime was their aunts and uncles, you know, <laughs> just getting these these things. Um, but I think the last time we were all uh, able to be together under one roof was 10 years ago. Um, and so this is a, a, a super special time. My sister's getting um, married uh, tomorrow. And uh, so her in future in-laws are back there. And so Dave and Sue, it's, it's great to have you guys. They're, they're from the missionary land of Wisconsin. Um, <laughs> they're still serving there. Uh, so. And it's been a joy to get to know you guys. And um, uh, I just want to thank you for creating Eric, um, because he, he truly is uh, wonderful. And anyone who can put up with my sister for a lifetime deserves a crown. <laughs> Relax, guys. It's, it's just a joke. He deserves much more than a crown. Okay? <laughs> so, but I am, I am so thankful that there are Eric's in the world, uh, because my middle daughter, Paisley, is definitely going to need all of an Eric when... <laughs> someday when, when she gets married. Actually, Taylor is one of my best friends, and I'm so excited for her. I love her deeply, and she's uh, the world's best auntie, in my opinion, uh, to, my, to my kids, and, and she was and is a, a fantastic big sister. We are continuing our series in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, so if you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn there. Um, but uh, before we read, we're going to be reading starting in verse 24, but we, before we read, I want to give you some context um, as, as to what Paul is addressing before our text and after our text. In verses 1 through 23, Paul discusses some rights that he personally has, yet he decides him to deny himself of those rights for the sake of the gospel. Okay, the beginning of chapter 9 is really an echo of chapter 8, where Paul talks about not eating food offered to idols because there were those in the church that, that were bothered and offended by people eating food that had been offered to idols, as if that food that had been offered to an idol had somehow been spiritually contaminated. And so he lays down his rights of saying, there's nothing wrong with this meat, I can eat it, but because it's causing another brother to to be stumbled in this this, this sense, I'm I'm laying down my right to eating meat. So um, this morning I confess that I'm a passionate carnivore. Um, I love meat. If you are uh, offended um, of me eating meat, you'll just have to pray for my soul as I indulge myself in all sorts of um, meats. Um, But back to the context, Paul is talking about how he cares more about the gospel than he cares about his personal rights. Now what, what this might look like in today's context is that I have a personal right and a freedom to have a political view, but I choose to not post my political views on any social media, on Facebook, whatever it might be, so that no one is, is um, uh, offended by that where it might get in the way of the gospel. What I'm saying is sometimes our rights of, of, of whatever would get in the way for the gospel to go forward. And so I choose uh, knowing that I'm trying to reach someone that might view things very differently than I do politically I choose not to post because really my main objection in life is not to change someone's mind politically, but to change their hearts and their minds with the gospel, right? I'm a hunter. I I love the outdoors. I've harvested all sorts of animals. If you've been to my basement, it's like a zoo, right? Um, and, And I choose, even though I have the right to post a picture with the deer that I harvest or whatever it is, I choose not to post that because I understand that there are some people who just 
might be offended by me hunting, even though I eat the meat and, and, and you know, I, I, I enjoy it as a, a hobby and I just choose not to exercise that right. And I have people tell me all the time, like, forget that, you know, like, they're just snowflakes. They just need to get over it. Who cares? You know who cares? I care. I care. Because I understand that the gospel of Jesus Christ is more important than promoting anything else that is just, just trivial, just like, just like a part of life. Who cares? Who cares, right? I, I want the gospel to not um, be, like, have, have a barricade by something that I say or something that I do. And so I just choose to lay down that right. And this really isn't my text today, but there might be some people in the room that need to give up their right of freedom of speech simply because your neighbor, your coworker, your family member, or the friend that you are trying to argue into the kingdom of God needs to hear more about a loving God than they need to hear why their views are wrong. What if we became as passionate about the gospel as Paul was? And if you're defensive in your heart right now, you better pray because there's nothing in here that I just said, that I just talked about, that is contradictory to the text. I'm just speaking what Paul was speaking the past two chapters in a present day context. Let's be less about ourselves and more about the kingdom. Skipping past our text, which starts in 24 and looking into chapter 10, Paul begins to remind his audience what happened with the Israelites who were God's chosen people he, he reminds them um, what happened when they failed to exercise spiritual discipline and they fell to their evil cravings. Paul talks about some of the consequences from their lack of discipline. They just, they just fell into what they wanted and, and what they desired. So knowing the context for the chapters surrounding our text will help us understand what Paul is saying. Let's start in verse 24 of chapter 9. You can follow along with me. Do you know, do, or do you not know that in a race all the runners run? but only one gets the prize. Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly, and I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it a slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Let's pray. Jesus, Um, I just pray this morning that you'd give me the strength physically, you'd give me the strength um, just mentally, that you'd allow me to be able to think clearly in this time, Uh, you'd remove all cloudiness, and I just pray even more than that, that you'd uncloudy our hearts, that we would lay down our our defensiveness, um, and that we would just really allow your word to speak truth into our hearts, and that you would just begin to change us by the power of your word and by the power of your Holy Spirit. And so God, this morning, those who are far from you, those who are close, some, those who are in between, Lord, may we all just lean into what you have. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said. Amen. So Paul starts this last portion of text in chapter 9 with an athletic metaphor of a runner running a race. See, Paul is smart. He understood his audience were, were all fans of, of sports. The people of Corinth loved sports. They certainly would have known about the games and stadiums based on the proximity of Corinth to the Isthmian Games, which were held under the patronage of the city of Corinth. Okay, the Isthmian Games were part of four major Greek athletics competitions, the others being the Olympic, the Pythian, and the Nimian Games. Okay, he likens our life, Paul likens our life and our Christian calling to a race, and in verse 24 he says, run this race in such a way as to win the prize. Run this race, our life, our Christian calling, in such a way as to win the prize. So I think that begs a couple questions. What is the race and what is the prize? Let's start with the race. Most theologians believe and agree that Paul is talking about life, which is, involves our calling. And I'm sure a lot of us have heard sermons preached on this text of, of how we're supposed to finish life well and finish strong and how we're supposed to discipline ourselves and, and purge any sin away from our life so that we can be complete and mature Christians. And you've maybe heard how here on earth and how we live here on earth really matters and, and how if you don't, maybe you can lose salvation. And while there's truth and there's some truth in that and, 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 and maybe it's been preached a little bit more works theology than the text actually is saying, you know, there's some truths in that. And yes, it does matter. I'm afraid that maybe this text in times past has been preached more of an individual running race instead of what Paul is talking about. 
Okay, I, I, I believe um, that, that Paul is talking about the entire book, which the theme of Corinthians, the theme of these chapters, is he's focusing about the entire body of Christ. So it seems odd to me if we were to read these last four verses as being super individually focused. Yes, there's an aspect of individual, and yes, you have a responsibility in running your race, but we cannot forget the whole context of this passage, which brings in the body of Christ. If we make the race of life all about our personal walk with Jesus Christ, and we make it all about ourselves, about our holiness, our righteousness, our good deeds, our self-discipline, our works, our family, our jobs, etc., then we are missing a major aspect of the part of the race of life. As we run this race called life, we must have peripheral vision to see others around us. When we cannot... We, we cannot be so inwardly focused that we neglect those that God brings into our path. In verse 25, Paul says that people go into strict training to win this crowd. And then he says, but we, but we do it for a crown that lasts forever. Paul brings in this sense of community where there are many people all pursuing the same prize. In, in um, March of 2014, Elizabeth and I, uh, decided that it would be a good idea to run a marathon in Rome, Italy. And so uh, we were training, training for this marathon, and if you know anything about me, I hate running. Like, running and I just don't, we don't get along. I wear a size 15 shoe, and I have zero arch in my foot. My foot literally f- sits flat on the ground. My, my arch touches the cement. It's cold. I'm pretty sure if I had an arch, I'd wear a size 12, which would make shoe shopping way more enjoyable for me. (laughs) And so we're training for this marathon, and about halfway through the training, uh, I suffered a hairline stress fracture, which essentially is like, you didn't really break your foot, it's just kind of like you're in a lot of pain, and so really the only medicine for it is to stay off your feet, you know, to, to, to not run. And so... Um, for five and a half weeks, I had to pause this training for this marathon, and um, I, I tried biking during this time to keep my muscles engaged, but it just wasn't the same. It happened to be over the holidays. I was like, great timing, right? Um, and, and it was just really, really difficult, um, but I, I knew this. I, I really wanted to get a marathon medal. Uh, it was a bucket list item, um, and, and I, I wanted to compete. So we wake up. We're in Rome. We wake up the morning of the race. It's 56 degrees outside and raining. Of course, I didn't have a raincoat. And of course, being my first marathon, I decided it'd be a good idea to wear a cotton (laughs) t-shirt. I had people come up and ask me, is it your first marathon? (laughs) I'm pretty sure they were from France. (laughs) I probably shouldn't have said that. You know, we're standing there, and if you've ever been a part of a, a, a race, you, you know that they kind of herd you together like cattle, and you're in these, like, gates, you know, and there's just thousands of people, and we're standing there like an hour and a half before the race starts, and it's raining, it's cold, I'm shivering, my shoes are soaked, my shirt is soaked, and uh, I, I forgot to mention this, but the farthest that I had made it in my training run was 14 miles. And I had to stop. That was supposed to be a 16-mile run, but my leg muscles were, like, convulsing and, like, twitching and, like, cramping. And and so I just stopped. And I was like, I I, I honestly, at this point, I have no idea if I'm going to be able to finish this race. I I should have stayed in bed. I could have toured the city. I would have had much more fun. Like, I just don't think I'm going to be able to do it. I'm wet. My shoes are going, you know, as I'm walking, as it's wet, and it's just nasty I just I didn't know and Elizabeth being like the positive little energizer bunny that she is you know she's like you can do it Austin we'll get through this it's gonna be fine I'm just like (laughs) you know it's not 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 helping so the race started we start running and we made this game plan and we had it all all mapped out in miles but over in Europe the race was marked in kilometers so we had no idea how to figure out pace, you know, like we were going to run some, walk some, run some. So we just decided uh, when we realized that we saw that first kilometer, we're like, you know what, let's just run for five minutes and then we'll, we'll walk for three minutes and we'll just see how far we can go. Elizabeth had completed 
the training. She was in great shape. It was no problem for her. And the race starts. We, we start running. We walk. We run. We walk. And, and what happened during that race was nothing short of spectacular in my mind. About halfway through the race, the runners around us were no longer competitors, but they became family. We were all encouraging one another. I saw people help other people stretch uh, out as they were cramping and they were having cramps. I saw other people that looked like they were doing just fine slow down their pace to help others and push others along and say, come on, you can do it. Push through this wall. We've got this hill and then we're downhill the next. You can do it. I saw people grab hands and, and, and put arms around their waist or around their shoulders and say, we're going to do this. We're going to finish this. And, and it was nothing short of, of amazing but also humbling at the same time because I was a recipient of a lot of that attention. <laughs> Here's a picture of Elizabeth and I after we finished the race. And uh, here's my medal after finishing the race. May have been limping across it. And I've never cried in winning anything. I'm a very competitive person. But I shed a tear when we crossed the finish line because there was no way that I would have been able to finish my race without my wife and all the strangers that were pushing and encouraging me. And I had my name on my, my banner there. And they said, let's go, Elizabeth. Let's go, Austin. You know, they didn't know how to say Austin. I'm thinking, can't you get my name right? I'm wet. I'm running. Come on, you know. And although I didn't meet my goal of my time, I met my goal of finishing. And I'm confident that I will never, ever do something as stupid as run 26.2 miles ever again. So dumb. But I learned something from that experience. I learned something. There is great joy in working together towards a goal so that we can all finish and receive our prize. And I don't know this, but I do have to wonder. I wonder if, if I had more joy finishing together with those that I was running than the person who ran by themselves and finished in first place and celebrated by themselves. Tim Cook, who took over Steve Jobs' position as Apple's CEO, said in an interview in 2016, and I quote, that it's sort of a lonely job. While there might not be scientific proof in the saying that it's lonely at the top, you might wonder if God intentionally designed us to do life with other people. Let's be a church that is committed to not just running the race, but running the race with the people that God has put around us around our brothers and our sisters. Listen, Sunday school classes, Wednesday night classes, small groups, all of those things are in place so that we can encourage each other. Plug in and be a part. Serve in some capacity and help the future generations find their path. Some of you guys are plum just being selfish, not giving up a night of your week to be in either a Wednesday night class or a small group, or you're saying, man, an hour and a half on Sundays is fine for me. I don't need Sunday school. I grew up in church. I know all the Bible stories. I'm not going to learn anything. Guess what? The church isn't all just about what you learn. The church isn't all just about you. The church is about us. And there's going to be times where you have a burden that is too big for you to carry. And you need other people to help you and encourage you. And there's other times where you are going to be the person that is encouraging. And, and putting your arm around and grabbing the hand and saying, come on, push through. We can do this. We have got to be about running the race together but let us not forget the preparation and the discipline that's needed to run this race well in verse 25 Paul talks about preparing with strict training and in verse 27 he uses some extreme symbolism where he says I strike a blow to my body to make it my slave in this context what Paul is saying he's not saying I'm I'm, I'm like warring against my body he's saying that that I fully devote my body to the service of Christ for others. The fight that we have is not against our physical body. It's a spiritual fight. That means our preparation for running the race needs to be spiritual. We are fighting against our sinful nature. And the most effective way to win the war against our flesh is to create spiritual disciplines that invites the Holy Spirit into our life so that he can enable us to do the things that he wants us to do. We have to create those disciplines that say, God, I welcome you in my life. You are the king of my heart. You are the king of my time. And there are spiritual disciplines. So let me give you some examples. Your flesh might say, let me hit the snooze and get up at the last minute before I leave for work or school. And while that might benefit us in a uh, a physical sense where we reap the benefit of just catching a, a couple extra Z's, what we don't understand is that 
our spiritual tank is benefiting nothing in that time. You have just spent six to eight hours refueling your flesh by sleeping and taking what your body naturally needs, but you have done absolutely nothing for those six to eight hours for your spirit and your soul. We see this discipline of of getting up and creating time as the first thing in, in the day in our Lord Jesus Christ. He gets up often early in the morning and spent time and it would seclude himself and spend time with the Father. And I've said this before, but why should we reward our physical bodies with food before we reward our spiritual cravings with time with Jesus? Man, it's, it's start your day off with the time of word. It's like stretching before running. It, it, it prevents uh, injuries. It's, you're less likely to get hurt. Benjamin Franklin once said this, and this is a wonderful quote. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Now what if we all as a church took it upon ourselves to start our day by asking God to clothe us in the armor of God? What, what if instead of at the end of the day we were saying, God, forgive me for this and forgive me for that, and, and at the beginning of our day say, God, prepare me for this and prepare me for that so that I might make you proud, so that I might receive a reward, but so that I might one day hear your voice say, well done, thy good and faithful service. Your servant service. <laughs> Start your day off with God. Your flesh might say, tonight I want to unwind by watching my favorite show on Netflix or Hulu. That's easy. That's comfortable. But what about, what about before indulging in something with no spiritual benefit? What about praying for five minutes for five friends who don't know Jesus? One minute a person. You know, I, 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 I remember going over to a friend's house growing up, and um, his, his little brother, his mom would make him do 25 sit-ups before he had a popsicle, <laughs> you know? And, and I, I kind of laugh about that. I still kind of give him a hard time when I see him from time to time, like, <laughs> you do your sit-ups for that? You know, and just, like, just kind of poke at him a little bit. But, you know, honestly, you guys do a lot of the same things. I can't have that cookie today because I didn't make my 5 a.m. kickboxing class. Really? You can show discipline to not eat a cookie that might make you fat, but you can't have the discipline to pray for people that are going to hell? Or take it a step further. Instead of watching a show, how about invite people over and entertain? Be hospitable. Minister out of your home. That's hard work. That takes sacrifice. You know what Elizabeth and I have discovered? There is no time that is convenient to entertain. There's not. I, I mean, if, if you have a time that's like convenient, I want to know your secret because th- that's just not the case. You know, and, and, and here's the thing. Like, oh, man, I, I could do this. I could do that. I've got, um, you know, all these to-do lists. Man, how many know that your to-do list never gets finished. It's never, ever, ever finished, right? So why not let's, as a church, make it a priority to build other people up? What if we spent that extra time and that energy of saying, man, I'm going to breathe life. I'm going to speak words of life into your life. Come into my home. I see that you're struggling right now in your race. Why don't you come so that I can breathe encouragement? You know, we've got these beautiful homes. We've got, we've got plenty of space most countries, they live grandparents all the way to grandkids, sometimes great kids, in one house. And we've got, you know, just all this space. We've got these nice kitchens with islands and all these different things and stuff. How come we're not using those for the kingdom of God? How come we're not bringing people along and pouring into them and encouraging them? I'm not trying to be like condemning in, in, in any way because I don't have anybody specifically in mind you know, when I'm talking about this, but I, I do know this, that, that we will be held accountable for the opportunities that we have someday before heaven. And I want us as a church to cross that finish line and, and God say, man, everything that I gave you, everything that I bless you with, you used it to further my kingdom, to further my, your talents, your home, your vehicle, your finances, your energy, your strength, your hard work. You use that because you understand that the gospel is important, and I want you to be that way, and would you join me in striving for that? It takes discipline. It's not easy. When was the last time that you just had a personal time of worship? 
Like literally, was the last time that you worshiped God last Sunday when you were here? Was the last time that you worshiped God, you know, two weeks ago when you were here because you missed last week? When, when was it that you just filled your house or you filled your car with, with, with the, the songs of God and just began to pour out your heart before him? How about this? Discipline yourself and use your brain to learn not just what to believe, but why we believe it. Because honestly, the question of you just have to have faith, or the answer of you just have to have faith, you just need to believe it, that has turned off a lot of people in religion. And there's a lot of people that don't know the truth because honestly, there's some lazy Christians that won't dig down and deep. And when your coworker, when your kid, when your grandkid comes to you with a difficult question, you just say, well, you just have to believe. You just have to have faith. I don't know. You know what? You can know. You can know. I think the world needs more doubting Thomases. I think, I think we need to dig down under this, like, this uh, surface of un, uncertain um, ground that we're standing on and dig down with those deep questions and find the bedrock where we can plant a foundation and then we can build our life off of that. There's answers to your difficult questions, but it takes some discipline to get there. If you're questioning God in this moment, but you haven't dug into the Bible And you haven't dug into the history because there is a plethora of resources that validate who Jesus was on earth. Did did you know that that Alexander the Great, that we get all of the information about Alexander the the Great from two resources that were written 400 years after he walked on the earth. And every New Testament document was written at on the most liberal side, 115 years after Jesus. But we, but we question about Jesus and, and the reality of Jesus and the ministry of Jesus, yet we don't bat an eye at Alexander the Great. We've, we've got to dig. That's not in my notes. I don't know where that came from. I know it's up there, and I know it's true. But we've got to dig. We've got to discipline ourselves. Invite the Holy Spirit into your heart so that you can effectively run your race. It's possible that you really struggle in doing what is right because you do very little training and preparation. Too often we get wrapped up in the race and we neglect the preparation. Too, too often we get wrapped up in the race, we neglect the discipline and, and the preparation in order to run it. Let me, let me say this a little bit differently and hopefully it'll click. Too often we get wrapped up with the law, with the do's and the don'ts, that we neglect the time we ought to spend with Jesus. Hear me, Jesus would always be with the Father before he would ever do anything for the Father. Do you see that? We can't mix that up. We, we cannot mix it up. We cannot make it about the works. We have to be there. And I'm not saying that we ignore obedience. I'm not saying that we ignore the law. Don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that, but we need to first have our priority as saying, Jesus, I want to spend time with you. God, I want to spend time with you because you're the one who enables me and fills me to be able to do what you want me to do. Man, if, if Christianity is just this big burden on you, it's, it's quite possible that you've got religion and you don't have God. And, and the reason why I say that is because God changes your heart. And so I can honestly say here today that things like giving, like tithing, like missions giving, I love it. I absolutely love giving. I, I, I absolutely love it. And it's not because... Of, of anything that I'm just like born that way or the DNA, trust me, like my first words were probably mine. You know, I bit my sister, I bit Ben McIntosh in the, the nursery and, and completely broke his skin in the, the two-year-olds. I was a little blood-sucking, selfish two-year-old, you know, like I just, you know. But God has changed my heart to value the things that he values. Do you understand that? What I literally have to do sometimes I literally pray this prayer. I say, God, place in my heart the desire to spend time with you. God, would you place in the heart the desire to dig deep into your word, to to, to discipline? You know why I have to pray that? Because I'm a human. You know why I have to pray that? Because in my flesh and in my desires, that's just not natural for me. It's okay to ask God because you know what? We need God's help even in loving God. It's true. You say, no, we don't, we don't. Yes, yes, we do. 
Because in our nature, we are wicked, we are sinful, we are broken, but God begins to mend what is broken and begin to heal and change our hearts. Let's invite God into all areas of our life so that we might be able to run the race to get the prize. But what is this prize? Both verses 24 and 27 make mention of this prize, and verse 25 talks about an eternal crown. And there's a little bit of disagreement between theologians as to what the prize is. Okay, we know that the prize is not salvation because salvation is a gift. It cannot be earned. For it is by grace through faith that a man is saved, not upon a man's work so that no man may boast, right? Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. So we know that salvation isn't the prize because that's, that's something that is given to us. We can't earn it. So I spoke with Dr. Wave Nunley quite a bit this week. Um, so Wave, if you're watching, I'm going to wave at you, Okay. And he was able to uh, shed some, some more light on the word prize. In every language, we have something called collective singulars. For instance, in English, a deer can be seen as either single or multiple. And, and unless you're from southern Iowa, then you'd call multiple deer deers, which is interesting. But the problem with translating, if, if we were to translate the sentence, I saw the deer from English to another language, is that we don't know if... I saw a deer or multiple deer. I saw the deer could mean both, right? So this becomes a struggle when translating the word prize because in the Greek it is a collective singular. We don't know um, if Paul is talking about a singular prize or multiple prizes. And it's likely, in my opinion, that it's multiple prizes that, that we're, we're racing for. It's just been translated as prize. Some people believe that the prize is is Jesus Christ. And this makes a lot of sense. Why do you want to be forgiven? Why do you want to be justified? Why do you want eternal life? The decisive answer is always because I want to spend forever with Jesus Christ. He's the prize. And not necessarily something that we can earn, but it's more like salvation and it's a gift. Some people believe the prize is seeing the people in heaven that you impacted their life to lead them to salvation. Now, not necessarily that you are the one who prayed the, the sinner's prayer, but maybe you did something to help point them to, and push them towards Christ, and, and there's this, this prize or reward. Some people believe that the prize is heaven. Other people believe that the prize is the benefits of heaven. No more sickness, no more pain, no more death. I don't believe there to be anything heretical in any of these beliefs. You know, knowing that, that we are living for heaven should motivate us to run well. There's an old song, and I think of it often, and I'm sure many of you know it, but it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of his dear face, all sorrows will erase. So bravely run the race till we see Christ. Man, knowing that we are living for, for heaven should just motivate us. Can I encourage you this morning that your present suffering is not worth comparing to the future glory that will be revealed in you. We live for the things that money can't buy and death can't take away. And I believe that heaven is a reward. I believe that Jesus Christ is our reward. And, and we will be removed from any sickness, suffering, or pain. We will be in the presence of Jesus Christ. And I can hardly wait. All things will be made new. I'm excited for that. That's worth running for. But to be completely honest with you this morning, I'm not entirely sure that any of us really know that the prize is, what the prize is that Paul mentions in this text. And here's why. In 2 Corinthians 5.10 says this, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due for the things done in body, whether good or bad. We're, we're going to be accountable for all of our actions here on earth. Okay, the, the judgment seat of Christ is different than the great, great white throne. The great white throne is, is paired with the book of life. Are you in or are you out? Are you a sheep or are you a goat? You know, are you a saint or you ain't, right? Um, the judgment seat of Christ, you're going to go through every opportunity, and he's going to say, were you faithful with the opportunities that were presented for you? And then you receive for what, what it was, good or bad. 1 Corinthians 3, 13 through 15 says, Their work will be shown for what it is, because the day, talking about the day of judgment, will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, 
but yet will be saved, even though as one escaping through the flames. This is probably not a thing that gets talked about a whole lot in churches. In fact, I had a conversation last night where the person was kind of um, very, uh, just like, I've never, you know, just taken back by this, but in reading these passages and reading these texts and remembering different things about martyrs in, in, in the revelations of John and the book of Revelations of them receiving these different robes and they've got a reward and different things, this leads me to believe that heaven is not socialistic. It sounds like some people will receive a reward while others narrowly escape the flames. Could it be better living accommodations? Could it be crowns and jewels? Could it be a better job? I really don't know, but what I do know is that God is a fair God, and however and whatever he decides, he will be fair and just in it. We don't get to determine what is fair or not fair because we are not perfect in nature. And, and, and I also know that in this, we're going to be judged on the basis of our faithfulness, not on the results of our faithfulness. So if you've been praying for your coworker or your son, your daughter, or whatever, and they never come to know the Lord, and you feel like a failure, you will be rewarded for your faithfulness, not the results of your faithfulness. God is a fair God, and he is a just God, and he gets to deem what the prize is and who deserves what. In the parable that Jesus talks about, about the workers working in the field, where you've got a worker that worked all day, you've got a, a worker that worked half a day, and you've got a worker that worked uh, a part of a day. And, and, and this rich man, the master, paid them all the same. And they're saying, this is unfair. And Jesus is saying, this is for the master, the ruler, to decide what is fair and what is not fair. And how many are thankful that God, one, is a merciful and gracious God, but also we know and we trust that he is a fair God. I spent the better part of three days reading, studying, calling different pastors and theologians, and no one really has been able to come up with a definite answer as to what exactly the prize is that Paul is, is talking about. But I am definite in this. Whatever the prize is, I know I want it. Because, but most importantly, even more than that, I just want to be with Jesus. I want to be in his presence. Verse 26 says, I don't run aimlessly. I don't box as if I'm beating the air. We as believers, we need to run with purpose. Everything that you say, everything that you do, everywhere that you go needs to have purpose. We need to train with purpose. Let's keep our eyes focused on Christ. Let's keep our, our eyes heavenward so that we might finish at the pearly gates. And let's be a church that is about bringing as many people with us on this journey as we possibly can. We're going to end a bit differently today. And this is how in just a minute we're going to close our eyes. We're going to tune out all distractions. We're going to listen to what God is speaking to us. And I believe that the majority of us, myself included, have some areas in our life where we need to become better in our spiritual preparations. That, that we have some disciplines that we could really learn to grow and, and reap the benefit of. You know, Rob Ketterling is a, a pastor up in Minnesota, and on his little uh, Instagram account, he says, you know, uh, striving not for the well done, but the well done, my good and faithful servant, you overachieved. You know, and I, at first I was kind of like, <laughs> you know, cute, whatever. But like, literally, I, I, I want everything within me to, to like, just God to just to stand there proud of me, just saying, man, you, you, you ran well. You didn't run all about yourself. You didn't just kind of seclude yourself from people that take up your time, your energy. Man, you, you ran well. And when, Whenever you saw someone down and out, you saw someone down on the sideline needing to stretch out, needing a hand up, you stopped, you were there, and you weren't just about yourself in this life, but you were about everyone that I placed in your path. Well done, thy good and faithful servant. So we're going to spend some time asking God to just gently speak to us one thing that we can start doing. And that, that, that could be very different for everyone in this room. It might be an area that you're not compliant and, and dis, disobeying and you're just, you, you, need, you need just a little nudge from the Holy Spirit. It might be something that I said about Sunday school or Wednesday night. I'm not trying to guilt. I'm not trying to place anything. If you feel a nudge in your heart 
about doing something, you need to trust that that's from God and it's not from me. I'd never, ever, ever want to manipulate you guys into doing something because you're missing the person of why we're doing it for. So in a moment, we're going to listen to the person that matters more than anybody else, Jesus Christ, and he's going to speak to us. But before we do that, I want to say one more thing, that Jesus Christ made a way so that you can be forgiven and someday fully united with God in heaven. There is no sin that has been committed that intimidates God. There is no past that is too dirty that, that God can't redeem. There is nothing that has been said or done that is too great for his indescribable grace. And if you're sitting here and you're feeling and asking the question, how could God ever love me? That answer has already been answered. And it was answered when Jesus Christ went to the cross. He died for your sin, for my sin. And he made it possible so that we could live in heaven forever with him. This morning, Jesus wants to forgive you. He wants to welcome you into his kingdom. He wants to set you free from the bondage of sin and shame. And he's calling you into a life that is abundant. And I want to give anyone here that hasn't accepted Jesus the opportunity to do that. But I'm going to let you think about that decision because it's a very serious decision. When you ask God into your life and you repent, what you're doing to repent literally means to turn. So you're turning from your sin, you're turning from your shame, you're, you're turning from your guilt, from your ways, and you're turning to Jesus. It's not that we just run away from those things. It's not that we just try to avoid those things. It's that we are intentionally running with purpose towards Jesus Christ. You know, Following Christ is a serious decision, and the wonderful thing about it is when you decide to ask Jesus into your life, he comes running to you. He puts his arm around you. He picks you up. He pulls you out. In all other religions, it's all about the individual working their self towards their God. But our God is the true living God, and he wants to forgive you, and he can forgive you, and he will forgive you. So would you all close your eyes and bow your heads, open up your hearts and your minds. I'm gonna pray, and we're just gonna take a moment just to, to listen. Jesus, I pray, God, in this moment that you'd begin to speak things to our hearts gently, that we'd have ears to hear, eyes to see, pray that you would reveal areas in our life that we are unfit, that we are not disciplined, that we have not taken control over, and I pray that by your spirit you would enter us, you'd, you'd enable us, you'd fill us with the ability to do what you're going to call us to do, Lord. For those that are afraid of what you're calling them into, whether that's missions, whether that's into a life of giving. God, I pray that, that they would trust in you, that they would know that, that you hold it all in your hands. So speak to your people this morning for we're listening. Let's just take a moment. Continued with your eyes closed and your head bowed just out of respect for your neighbor, I just want to give that invitation. Is there anyone here today that would say, Austin, I've lived my life apart from God, but I want to invite him into my heart. I want to repent. I want to turn from my sins. I need the forgiveness. I need Jesus to come and save me. I'm lost and I want him in my life. And for the first time today, you'd say, Austin, I'm inviting Jesus into my life. If that's you, with every eye closed and head bowed, would you just raise your hand 
and look up at me where I can make eye contact with you. I want to be able to pray for you this morning. Is there anyone? Yes, I see you. Is there anyone else? Would you just repeat a prayer just in your heart similar to what I'm going to pray? Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Come into my life. Begin to change my heart. I give you control of every situation. I give you control of every decision, Lord, for you are Lord and you are master. So forgive me of my sin. Change my heart, O God. And save me today. I believe that you can save me. I believe that you're the son of God. I believe that you're living. And so I trust you with my life today. In Jesus' name, amen.